Okay. Uh, so it's a pleasure to introduce our uh, today's speaker, Jonathan Gorard from uh, the University of Cambridge and uh, Wolfram Research Company. And today will tell us about the, uh, the Wolfram model, introduction to the Wolfram model. So please, uh, Jonathan, the virtual stage is yours. Enjoy. Thank you so much. Um, so, you know, well, first of all, thank you so much, all of you guys, for, for coming. Thank you to the INFN for actually organizing these, or for hosting these, these wonderful um, Newton 1665 seminars. And thanks so much to Alfredo and for all of the organizers for actually inviting me to come and speak. Um, I feel very much uh, out of place being here. So not, not least because I, I suppose I should apologize at the beginning. Uh, I, I'm very much not a high energy physicist. I am a mathematician, but, uh, but nevertheless, I hope I can, I can say something that my, might be of interest to you guys. And uh, My apologies if not. So um, this is intended to be a very short, uh, necessarily rather terse, but hopefully self-contained uh, introduction to this thing called the Wolfram model, which is a new discrete space-time formalism that uh, I guess you can think of as being kind of a sibling of things like the causal set theory and causal dynamical triangulation programs, and arguably a more distant cousin of the whole kind of uh, loop quantum gravity, spin network, spin foam story. So it's a discrete space-time formalism based on what are called hypergraph transformation rules or set substitution systems. And I'm going to try, first of all, to, to explain uh, exactly what that means. So, uh, but first things first, I, I should sort of state right off the bat that um, all of the uh, original research that I'm going to be presenting here was, was done in collaboration with Stephen Wolfram and Max Piskanov. This particular talk will be based on primarily on two of the preprints by myself and Stephen, uh, covering some elementary properties of the model and some of its relativistic and, and gravitational implications. But there's, you know, there's much more to say than I can reasonably fit into a 50 minute talk. And so uh, for those of you who are interested in, in finding out more, you know, that there's, uh, you can download all of our research materials, our papers, our preprints, everything uh, from, from the Wolfram Physics uh, research website. Okay, anyway, let's start with, let's start with the, uh, the, the basics. So you know, what is a hypergraph? That, that part's easy. So a, a hypergraph is a generalization of an ordinary graph in which uh, one has hyper edges that rather than connecting exactly uh, two vertices can connect any arbitrary non-empty subset of vertices. Um, so uh, in, the, in the case of a directed hypergraph or an ordered hypergraph, you can think of this as being just a, a, a collection of ordered relations between elements. So on the left here, we have a collection of, of ordered uh, arity two relations, binary relations, that therefore corresponds to a directed graph. And on the right here, we have a collection of arity three relations, which therefore corresponds to a hypergraph in which each hyperedge connects exactly three vertices. Now, to be, to be a bit more precise, uh, for the purposes of this talk, I'm actually going to be discussing the case in which E is allowed to be a multi-set, and in which therefore we, we are actually considering multi-hypergraphs in which hyperedges are allowed to have arbitrary multiplicity. But that's a that's a sort of uh, somewhat irrelevant uh, technical uh, point. So uh, I, I should say sort of at the beginning that you know the the, the fun, one of the fundamental intuitions behind this model is that space, far from being a continuum, is just a very large collection of discrete points with a uh, with an adjacency structure defined on them. By, uh, by, by the, the relations of, of ordered hyperedges. And so uh, that, that gives us a kind of an underlying statics. And then the dynamics of the model uh, is defined in terms of hypergraph transformation rules. So we have rules like this that say basically, you know, if you have a hypergraph, if you have a piece of hypergraph that looks like this, then you can replace it with a piece of hypergraph that looks like that. So you're, you're, you're matching uh, sort of the left-hand side of some, some rule pattern uh, to, to a, a, a sub-hypergraph that's isomorphic to that pattern and replacing it with a sub-hypergraph sub that's uh, isomorphic to this pattern. So set theoretically, you can formalize that as a set substitution rule. So you're basically saying in your collection of ordered relations between elements, if you have a subset that matches this pattern, then replace it with a subset that matches that pattern. So then we can start from a very, very simple initial hypergraph, uh, something like this that consists of three nodes and, and, and two hyperedges. And then just by applying this rule wherever it can be applied, but you know, by attempting to update every possible vertex by applying this rule in all possible places, then we can obtain a, an evolution of this hypergraph through time. So if we apply it for five evolution steps, you can trace the evolution, we get this thing over here. If we apply the same rule for 10 evolution steps, we, we, get, uh, we get this more complicated evolution over here. If, in fact, if we, applied the, if we applied this rule for 15 evolution steps, we would eventually get this rather magnificent looking creature. So this is a, a, a very beautiful object with a bunch of really interesting uh, sort of mathematical and combinatorial properties. And I could give, I could give a whole series of lectures on the, on the sort of mathematical properties of these hypergraph systems just in their own right. Um, but you know, the question you might be asking at this point is, 
what does any of this have to do with physics? So um, the, 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 you know, what, the, the question that we've been interested in is, could it be the case that hyper, you know, formalisms based on hypergraph transformation dynamics of this kind, could they be a reasonable kind of minimal underlying candidate for the actual dynamics of our physical universe? Seems like a slightly you know, bizarre sort of idea, but um, nevertheless, it's actually a, it's, it's a hypothesis that we can test empirically because, um, you know, in effect, if we, think of the, if we think of this as being like the evolution of some, you know, computational universe, then each such hypergraph transformation rule effectively corresponds to a different candidate universe. And then we can just enumerate the space of all hypergraph transformation rules of a particular size, rules of a particular given uh, signature, and effectively, therefore, enumerate the space of all such candidate universes. And we see things like this. So this is, <clears throat> this is a small sample of the space of all such hypergraph transformation systems. So you see the hypergraphs we obtain at the top here and the hypergraph transformation rules that produce them at the bottom. And so effectively, the question that we wanted to ask was, uh, could it be the case that you know, somewhere in, in this space of all possible such universes, in all, all possible candidate universes, that there exists one that you know, has the same features as our physical universe? Like I say, it seems like a slightly crazy idea, but the remarkable thing that we've discovered is that there actually exist large classes of hypergraph transformation rules, which we can prove are, uh, Im imply in the large scale limit known features of, 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 sort of, of our physical universe, including, but not limited to, uh, special relativity with both Lorentz and Pankari invariants following from this general property of these systems that we call causal invariants. They also turn out to imply general relativity and, and aspects of gravitation uh, as a consequence of both causal invariants, a weak ergodicity hypothesis that we make about the microscopic dynamics of the hypergraph transformation rules, and this property that the, uh, this thing that we call the causal network, which I'll introduce in a moment, uh, limits to something that has fixed dimension and is therefore kind of manifold-like, that it turns out that the most general set of constraints that give you those three uh, axioms, that, that, that are consistent with those three axioms, are exactly the Einstein field equations in the continuum limit, and I'd like to kind of walk you through that derivation today. Um, there, are some, there are lots of other things that I probably won't have time to get to uh, in, in this particular talk that have relevance for things like cosmology. So in particular, um, it turns out that a fairly generic feature of these models is that they start out being, the hypergraphs start out being very densely connected initially, and then gradually converge down to something that's, that's more sparsely connected. You can think of that as the, the, the spatial hypergraph corresponding, uh, starting off in effectively infinite dimensions and converging down to something finite dimensional. And that, that turns out to be consistent with our formulation of GR, um, and it also implies that effectively the, that there's a kind of phase transition in the effective speed of light during the early universe, which we can show that, that it's, it's not too difficult to prove that that implies a conformal structure for, for space time that is actually consistent with the sort of predictions made by inflationary cosmology. And in particular, you know, um, constitutes a valid solution to both the horizon of flatness problems of, of lambda CDM cosmology. It's also possible uh, to derive many features of the standard mathematical formalism of quantum mechanics and quantum field theory, including but not limited to the path integral. Uh, the derivation of the path integral, by the way, integral is uh, turns out to be very sort of mathematically beautiful. It's kind of the it's the direct analog. So if you consider, I mentioned the Einstein field equations kind of occur in the continuum limit of these causal networks, the the, the, the causal partial order for one of these uh, for one of these hypergraph systems, that are in a way that I'll explain momentarily. But there's also this thing called the multi-way causal network that contains uh, causal relationships between events, not just on a single branch of evolution history, but actually between branches of evolution history. And it turns out applying exactly the same argument that gives you the Einstein equations to the multi-way causal graph gives you the, the, the path integral, the, the standard path integral action taking the place of the Einstein-Hilbert action in the continuum limit. And there's a bunch of really cool uh, geometry and mathematics that, that kind of underlies that with the, the fubini studi metric tensor on projective Hilbert spaces taking the place of the standard space-time metric tensor. And we have a nice uh, interpretation of things like the canonical commutation relations as effectively the analog of, of Riemann curvature, as the analog of the failure of commutativity of the covariant uh, derivative operator in, in the context of the multi-way causal network. So I, I, if I have time, I'll try to give some hints about the quantum mechanical side of things towards the end of this talk. But in the interests of, of time constraints, I'm going to try to be disciplined and restrict myself just to talking about the relativistic and gravitational properties uh, of the model. If you want to find out more about the other sides of the formalism, please feel free to read our papers, or um, I'm also happy to give a follow-up talk, a part two to this, <laughs> at some point in the future if you guys are up for it. Um, okay, anyway, let, let's get to some actual content. So um, let's start with SR, because that's actually, you know, that, that's pretty easy. So um, one concern that you might very reasonably have if you're first confronted with this formalism is about the uniqueness of the evolution history, the uniqueness of the updating order. Because if you're given a spatial hypergraph like this and a rule like that, there will 
generically be many possible places in which you could apply that rule. There's no canonical updating order. There's no canonical first place where that rule should get applied. Um, by the way, I mean, I'm skipping ahead a bit, but that, that statement that there's no canonical updating order for hypergraphs turns out in the continuum limit to correspond to the statement that there's no preferred reference frame in the universe. Um, so, uh, and, and so effectively, if you, if you consider the, the sort of sets of space-like separated updates or updating events that you could apply, in other words, the sets of updating events where the inputs don't overlap, they don't you know, make use of the same collections of nodes, um, there will in general be many different possible sets of space-like separated updating events that could be applied in parallel without conflict. And each one of these corresponds to a different possible updating order for the hypergraph. And in general, these different updating orders will yield different evolutions. They will yield non-isomorphic spatial hypergraphs. So you might very reasonably be concerned that the evolution of one of these Wolfram model systems is non-deterministic. And that's a very, very good concern. Um, and so, and in fact, it's true. So, so in general, um, rather than having a single evolution path, rather than having a single thread of time, the evolution of an arbitrary Wolfram model system actually corresponds to a directed acyclic graph that we call the multi-way system or the multi-way evolution graph. So here's a simple example for this very simple hypergraph uh, transformation rule here. So the multi-way evolution graph is, as I say, a directed acyclic graph in which every uh, node is, uh, is a particular hypergraph, corresponds to a particular state of the universe. And every uh, gray edge, every directed edge here, corresponds to a rewrite operation. So it corresponds to an application of this rule. And so the multi-way system, the multi-way evolution graph, effectively parameterizes all possible uh, evolution histories, all possible updating orders for this Wolfram model system. And so, again, we, we come back to this question of, so how can you get a deterministic evolution? Well, it turns out there exists a large class of these hypergraph transformation rules that satisfy a property we call causal invariance, which I'd like to define for you in just a moment. And causal invariance effectively says, in a very precise sense, that the order of evolution doesn't, that the, the, the order of application of these updating events doesn't matter. And, uh, and so therefore, it, it's causal invariance that allows you to, to obtain effectively deterministic evolution of the Wolfram model system. Rather excitingly, it also turns out to be a sufficient condition for proving, for proving both Lorentz and Poincare symmetry, which is the basis of our derivation of SR. And I'd like to kind of walk you through how that works uh, now. So before I can define causal invariance, I first have to introduce a, a deeply related concept from mathematical logic. So in the theory of, of abstract rewriting systems in logic, there's this concept we call confluence or global confluence, which is uh, in older texts, I think it's referred to as the Church-Rosser property because of its relation to the untyped lambda calculus that was uh, investigated by Alonzo Church and J. Barclay Rosser back in the 1930s. And so uh, an abstract rewriting system uh, or an ARS is just a set of elements, which we'll call A, equipped with some binary relation, which we'll call arrow, and sort of intuitively, you know, the, the, that, that set A is the set of all objects in your rewrite system, and the binary operation is the rewrite relation. So in the context of a Wolfram model system, if we, if we express a Wolfram model system as an ARS, the set A is the set of all possible hypergraphs, and the rewrite relation tells you that one hypergraph can be transformed into another. So in, so in this multi-way evolution graph here, uh, each, of these, each of these nodes is an element of A, is an element of the, the, the rewrite system, and each directed edge corresponds to a, an instance of that rewrite relation. So, so A arrows B indicates that uh, the, the, the vertex in the multi-way evolution graph corresponding to hypergraph A is directly connected to the vertex corresponding to hypergraph B. They are connected by a single directed edge. So then once you have a notion of the rewrite relation, you can define its reflexive transitive closure, which we'll call arrow star, which is the transitive closure of the union of the rewrite relation with the identity relation. So, uh, so effectively what that's, so A arrow star B implies either A and B are equivalent, they are, they are isomorphic hypergraphs. Oh yeah, I should have mentioned, I mean, um, the, 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 the merging criterion for these multi-way systems is hypergraph isomorphism, as you might expect. So either A and B are isomorphic, or there exists a finite rewrite sequence that connects A to B. So in other words, if you consider the vertices corresponding to hypergraphs A and B in the multi-way system, you're saying that they're connected by some finite path, or more precisely, that the vertex corresponding to hypergraph B exists in the out component of, vertex, of the vertex corresponding to hypergraph A in the multi-way evolution graph. So effectively, this, this reflective transitive closure is saying A can be rewritten as B by some sequence. And so then we can define this notion of global confluence, which is exactly the statement that for any triple of elements, A, B, and C, in your abstract rewriting system, uh, if it is the case that A can be rewritten as B and A can be rewritten as C, 
then it is also the case that there exists some common element D such that B can be rewritten as D and C can be rewritten as D. So effectively, intuitively, what that's saying is anytime you have an ambiguity in your updating order, anytime you get a bifurcation in the multiway system, then so, you, so the multiway system bifurcates into two independent paths, then it will always be possible for those two paths to reconverge on some common future element. That, that you know, for any uh, elements B and, and C that exist on those two paths, there's, a common, there's an element D that exists in the kind of common future light cone, so to speak, of, of, of the elements B and C. So global confluence is one very precise sense in which we can say, uh, one very precise context in which we can say uh, that the updating order doesn't matter because it's always possible to get back to a, to a common shared state. So global confluence, as I say, is deeply related to, in fact, we can prove is a necessary condition for this much stronger condition that we call causal invariance. To explain what that means, I have to introduce this notion of a causal network. So um, given a multiway system, or, or more precisely, given a path through the multiway system, given a particular evolution history, you might ask, you know, so e you know, each, of these, each of these directed edges corresponds to an application of one of these rules. It corresponds to a single updating event. And so you might ask what orders of updating events are and are not permitted, or more, uh, to, to be more specific, what, uh, what are the causal dependencies between updating events? Because it could be the case that some updating event depends on a previous updating event having already been applied. And that's what the causal network is trying to, to demonstrate. So the causal network is a directed acyclic graph in which all of the vertices are updating events and in which the directed edges are causal relationships between those updating events. So here's a very simple example. So each yellow box here is a, is a representation of one of these hypergraph updates, uh, updating events, and each orange edge is a causal relationship between the two. So the directed edge A to B exists if and only if A causes B, or event B could only have been applied if event A had previously been applied. And the way we can determine that mathematically is we say that the input for event B has a non-trivial overlap with the output of event A. In other words, if event B makes use of nodes that were produced by the output of event A, then we know that event B couldn't have been applied if event A hadn't previously been applied. So that's what the causal network is trying to show you. So uh, in effect, we can think of the causal, uh, the updating events that are separated by directed causal edges, we can consider to be time-like separated. And conversely, any, any updating events that are not connected, directly connected by causal edges, we can consider to be space-like separated. And therefore, uh, they, they correspond to non-overlapping updating events within the spatial hypergraph, which can therefore be applied simultaneously without any kind of conflict. And so, in effect, my statement earlier that there are different updating orders corresponds to the statement that there exists different possible sets of space-like separated updating events that we can consider to be simultaneous. And that will be important in just a moment. Um, by the way, I mean, again, I'm going to say this kind of rather suggestively about uh, hinting at something that's about to come. One can think of the transitive reduction of the causal network as being the Hasse diagram for the induced causal partial order for these hypergraph transformation systems. Or to be even more suggestive, you can think of, it, of the transitive reduction as being a representation of the conformally invariant structure of some kind of skeletonized Lorentzian manifold, of some discrete approximation to a Lorentzian manifold. And that's going to become an, uh, also very important in just a moment. So then I finally, <laughs> I'm able to, to give a precise definition of causal invariance. So causal invariance is precisely the claim that, uh, that independent of which updating order you choose, the causal network you end up with is always the same up to isomorphism. So in other words, uh, we say a Wolfram model system is causal invariant if and only if all of the different possible evolution histories, all the different possible paths through the multi-way evolution graph yield causal networks that are all ultimately isomorphic as directed acyclic graphs. So down here, you can see an example of a, of a multi-way system that is explicitly causal invariant. And so, uh, so in this case, you can see all of the, each blue box corresponds to a different hypergraph, a different state of the universe. Each, uh, each yellow box corresponds to an application of an updating event. And each orange edge, as usual, corresponds to a causal relationship between those updating events. And in this case here, you can just see by tracing explicitly the, the four possible paths through the system, uh, that, that, there, that, that all of the causal networks that you obtain, all the relationships between the, the updating events that you see on those different paths are, are ultimately the, the same. That in fact, in this case, all, of the, all four causal networks are actually trivial. They're all just, uh, they're, they're all just path graphs uh, that consist of exactly four updating events connected by three causal edges. So I already mentioned that uh, global confluence is a, is a necessary condition for causal invariance. We can prove that if the system is causal invariant, then it's necessarily globally confluent. But 
perhaps more excitingly, we can also prove that if the system is causal invariant, then it also obeys Lorentz symmetry. In fact, we can prove it, it obeys Prancari symmetry. And in a slightly strengthened form, we can even prove it obeys local Lorentz symmetry, which forms part of the basis of our G, GR derivation that, uh, that I want to show in, in a minute. OK, so I already mentioned this, this rather suggestive comment about you know, thinking of the, the transitive reduction of the causal network as being the Hasse diagram for, some, you know, for the conformally invariant structure of some discrete approximation to a Lorentzian manifold. And, uh, uh, and in particular, uh, all of the sort of standard algebraic and differential top, uh, topology uh, sort of techniques that you could apply in, in the context of you know, conformal structure of Lorentzian manifolds, you can also apply to the combinatorial structure of the causal network. So you know, here's, a, here's a trivial example. Uh, you can, we can define you know, notions of causal future, causal past in the causal network. So if the causal future J plus uh, uh, for some updating event X just corresponds to the out component of that vertex X. The causal past corresponds to the in component of that vertex X. So we get an immediate kind of combinatorial interpretation of the past and future light codes of, of an updating event. OK, so uh, as I've sort of mentioned a couple of times now that, you know, one can think of these different choices of updating order corresponding to different choices of space-like separated updating events to consider to be simultaneous. So each one of those can effectively be thought of as a different choice of foliation of the causal network into simultaneity surfaces, into space-like hypersurfaces, into co sort of collections of updating events that are, that are space-like separated in the sense that they do not, they are not directly connected by, by causal edges. And so each such foliation of the causal network corresponds to a different possible updating order for the spatial hypergraph. So if we construct a, uh, if we construct this, if we consider this very simple hypergraph transformation rule here, we can do a layered digraph embedding of the causal network like this. Um, and then we can pick the kind of default foliation choice, which happens to correspond to our, our default choice of, of updating order for the hypergraph. And so, this, so you can consider this as being the, you know, the causal network foliation as seen by an observer in some rest frame. And then, the, so that observer sees this particular sequence of, of hypergraphs in, in their evolution history. But the point is, there will generically be many different foliations of the causal network into simultaneity surfaces of events that are nevertheless consistent with the causal partial order. And so here's a different foliation we could have chosen. It's a slightly more complicated one. And so, but this foliation is still perfectly compatible with the, with the, uh, with the causal partial order. And so an observer in this foliation would see this very different uh, sequence of hypergraphs. So in particular, you know, for instance, you can see here, the third hypergraph as seen by this observer is clearly non-isomorphic to the third hypergraph as seen by this observer. So the, but this is still nevertheless a valid choice of updating order. Here's the key point though. Causal invariance guarantees that the conformal structure, the, the, sorry, that the, that the combinatorial structure of the causal network is unchanged between different choices of updating order. And so in particular, guarantees that if you, make a, if you make some parameterized change of foliation of the causal network, then even though your ordering of space-like separated updating events will change, the ordering of your time-like separated updating events, i.e. those updating events that are uh, specified by the causal partial order, that, that, that are linked by directed edges, will always be preserved. And so in the, in the particular case where your foliations are, are spatially flat, in, in a sense that I'll define in a minute, um, this corresponds precisely to the, state, to the statement of Lorentz symmetry, and therefore is, is the thing that guarantees that these models are compatible with special relativity. And in fact, if you think about it, that's actually pretty obvious, because as I mentioned, uh, you know, the, the, the causal network is some discrete approximation to the conformal structure of a Lorentzian manifold. And so, uh, in particular, it, the causal invariance, the statement that there is just a single causal network up to isomorphism, that's defined uniquely, corresponds to the statement that the combinatorial structure of the causal network is invariant under the action of the conformal group. And so because both the Lorentz and Pancari groups are subgroups of the conformal group, uh, you know, Lorentz and, uh, Lorentz and Pancari symmetry follow, follow pretty trivially. And if you want to, you can then go and derive all of the standard properties of the Lorentz transform kind of from, from first principles. So like, you know, here is a, here's a one-dimensional hypergraph evolution uh, that, whose causal network happens to be this rather simple grid-like structure and so we, we can construct a default foliation that we can think of as corresponding to the, to the updating order as seen by an observer in a rest frame. But if we wanted to, we can construct a boosted foliation uh, in which we, we now get this different evolution order that we can think of as being the evolution order of the hypergraph as seen by an observer moving at some finite velocity with respect to the rest frame. And so in particular, you know, but by sort of elementary geometry, we can see that whereas this observer takes 14 evolution steps to move from the initial hypergraph to the final one, the observer in the rest frame takes only 11. And so, as I say, with, with, with sort of basic geometry, all the standard features of you know, time dilation, length contraction, relativistic mass transformation, those can all be derived from first principles uh, for, the, for the full gory details of all that. You know, go, go and see our papers. Okay, 
there's one crucial sort of uh, mathematical subtlety that I've kind of glossed over in, in doing this, which uh, you may have noticed, which is that I kind of introduced this concept of a causal network foliation by a sort of sleight of hand uh, move. And so those of you who are kind of more mathematically inclined might very reasonably be asking, you know, what, what exactly is a causal network foliation? How do we think about them? How do we parameterize them and so on? That, that's a very legitimate, that's a very good and, and legitimate question. So it turns out it's a slightly uh, mathematically non-trivial story, but uh, actually we've been able to make extensive use of the techniques of geometric quantization and canonical Hamiltonian quantum gravity to effectively uh, derive a, a discrete approximation to the ADM formalism in standard general relativity. So in all of the causal networks that I've shown so far, and in fact, all of the ones I'm going to show later on, uh, we're assuming that they are all globally hyperbolic. And global hyperbolicity in, in our context corresponds to a very precise uh, combinatorial statement. It corresponds to the statement that the causal network can be, that we can construct a layered digraph embedding of the causal network into the plane in such a way that all of the causal edges point monotonically downwards. And if we construct a layered digraph embedding in which a causal edge does not point monotonically downwards, that corresponds to a local failure of hyperbolicity. So anyway, assuming a globally hyperbolic causal network that can be embedded in this way, we can define a universal time function on that causal network that maps each updating event to an integer corresponding to the index of the space-like hypersurface on which that updating event lies, such that delta t is non-zero everywhere, effectively such that um, between any updating event and its corresponding future updating event on the neighboring space-like hypersurface, there must exist at least one causal edge. There has to exist at least one elementary time interval between those, between those two events, so that those two uh, space-like hypersurfaces don't sort of trivially intersect. In which case, this definition of the universal time function uh, immediately foliates the causal network into this uh, parametric family of non-overlapping space-like hypersurfaces that are the level sets of that universal time function. Um, and so then we can ask the question of, well, how do we parameterize this foliation? And to do that, as I kind of alluded to, we can just do the discrete analog of the ADM gauge choice. So uh, in particular, start by noticing that each of these spatial hypergraphs has a natural distance metric defined upon it, which is the combinatorial distance. So if you have a pair of vertices, we can ask what is the graph, what is the length of the, of the graph geodesic between those two vertices? What is the length what is the, you know, it, for the shortest path between those two vertices, what is the number of directed hyperedges that we have to cross in order to get from one to the other? That induces uh, effectively a discrete spatial metric tensor, which I'll call gamma ij. And so now, at each, for each updating event in the causal network, we can define a lapse function alpha and a shift vector beta. So, that, so, that, so alpha is effectively defining the number of causal edges separating uh, an updating event on one hypersurface from its corresponding updating event on the next hypersurface. So it's indicating the, the elementary time-like separation between the, the, those, those two points on the neighboring hypersurfaces. And the shift vector beta is indicating the spatial hypergraph distance between the location on the hypergraph where the, the first updating event got applied and the location in the hypergraph where the second updating event got applied. And so, uh, so by, by defining a lapse function and a shift vector for every updating event in the causal network, we can completely determine its foliation into space-like hypersurfaces. And combining all of that together, it allows us to write a, a, a discrete line element for the overall causal network that actually has effectively the same form as the standard space-time line element in, in the ADM formalism. OK. That's a bit about SR, but we'll come, on to, we'll come back to some of the ideas in just a moment. But I, I'd like now to talk about something that's a bit more complicated, which is how we go about deriving GR in the context of this formalism. So um, I, because this is a, a slightly more involved um, procedure, I'm going to start, for the purposes of kind of pedagogy, I'm going to start from a toy case, which is considering curvature just in spatial hypergraphs, before moving on to the full space-time case, which is considering curvature in causal networks. So. Um, you know, first, very obvious thing to say is, of course, these, these networks that we're considering, the hypergraphs and the causal networks that we're considering are obviously not manifolds. They don't have manifold structure. They don't, have, they don't satisfy the axioms of a manifold. Um, so we can't just define something like a Ricci scalar uh, on, on something like a spatial hypergraph, which might seem like a, like a problem. But nevertheless, we, could, we can ask the question, can we define a quantity on the spatial hypergraph that preserves our usual geometrical intuition for what the Ricci scalar is in the Riemannian case. So just to remind you of something you all know perfectly well, you know, in, in, the, sta for the, in the standard Riemannian manifold, the, the usual geometrical intuition for what the Ricci scalar represents is if you pick a point P in, in that manifold and you grow out a finite ball of radius epsilon, which we'll call B epsilon P in that manifold, the Ricci scalar is what determines the ratio of the volume of that ball to the, to the volume of, of a ball of, of the same radius B epsilon 
um, in ordinary flat Euclidean space, or more precisely, it's the Ricci scalar that gives you the second order correction term in, that, in the discrepancy between the two volumes. So uh, a mathematically equivalent way of, of making the same statement that turns out to be slightly more directly amenable to, to the hypergraph case is if you consider a, a finite geodesic ball V epsilon P centered at, at point P, and you parallel transport all the points on that ball to a, to a neighboring point, to a, to a, a ball um, centered on a neighboring point, which we'll call B epsilon Q, um, then you can ask the question, what is the average distance, or what is the ratio of the average distance between a point on B epsilon P and its corresponding point mapped off to parallel transport onto B epsilon Q? Uh, what, what is its ratio to the actual distance between, uh, the metric distance between points P and Q, which we'll call delta? And so again, that, that ratio uh, turns out to be uh, up to second order determined by, by the Ricci scalar at, at point P. And this is in the limit as both the radius epsilon goes to zero and the separation distance between the centers delta goes to zero. So, um, so then you might ask, well, you know, can we define an analogous quantity on one of our hypergraphs? And the answer turns out to be yes. So uh, this is a mathematical problem that's been worked on by many people, including folks like Robin Foreman, uh, Jürgen Jost and others. But uh, in, in our particular research, we've made use of an extended uh, many of the mathematical constructions that are due to Jan Olivier. So, so Olivier in particular has constructed a, a generalization of the Ricci scalar that applies to arbitrary uh, metric spaces, including, uh, direct, uh, including discrete metric spaces, which include, of course, uh, directed hypergraphs. So the, the kind of the big picture uh, intuition behind uh, Olivier's construction is that you generalize the notion of a volume measure given by a geodesic ball in a manifold to a probability measure in your metric space. And then this concept of the average distance between a point on the geodesic ball and its corresponding point after parallel transport then becomes the, uh, the, a measure of the Wasserstein distance, the transportation distance from one measure to another measure. Okay, so just to remind you all of a, of a bit of elementary measure theory, uh, if you have a Polish space X that's equipped with a metric D and it's also equipped with a Borel sigma algebra, then we can define a, a set of, uh, uh, so for, for each point in the metric space X, we can define a probability measure MX that has finite first moment and where the, 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 the map uh, going from the point X to the measure MX is itself a measurable map, in which case we call the set of all such probability measures a random walk. And so this random walk then allows us to define the, the Wasserstein distance metric on, on the metric space. So, uh, okay, those of you who know about measure theory will, will know that there are actually infinitely many different Wasserstein uh, distances of all kinds of different orders, but actually we're just interested in the boring case, the first order case, which is the, the one Wasserstein distance. So if you have two probability measures, MX and MY, you can ask the, the, the Wasserstein transportation distance is the optimal di transportation distance between those two measures. So the kind of the standard intuition is it's like an earth mover distance. So if you think of the measure MX as being like a sand pile, you know, heaped at position X, then the, you know, the, the, the Wasserstein distance is telling you the, the amount of work that you need to do to disassemble the measure at position X, transport it over to position Y, and reassemble it at position Y. And so uh, we can express that formally as an infimum uh, taken over the set of all probability measures defined on the Cartesian product of the metric space with itself, which effectively designates the couplings between those random walks that project onto the measure MX and those random walks that project onto the measure MY. That gives us the, the one Wasserstein distance. And so then, as I say, we, we think of that as being like this notion of the average distance between points on two geodesic balls, in which case the uh, Olivier gives us this construction of the, of the scalar curvature. So if you have two points P and Q that are nearby, it, that are separated by some distance epsilon in, in the metric space, then the Olivier Ricci scalar at point P can be thought of as being one minus the ratio between the Wasserstein transportation distance from measure MP to measure MQ to the actual metric distance between the points P and Q. And so this is nice because in particular, you can see in the special case where X is a manifold and where D is, a, you know, is, is, is an ordinary Riemannian metric and M becomes the, the standard Riemannian volume measure in terms of you know, finite, finite geodesic balls, then this Olivier Ricci scalar is exactly, you know, the, the Riemannian Ricci uh, at, at point P is exactly the Riemannian Ricci scalar at point P up to some arbitrary multiplicative constant. And so this gives us the formal justification for uh, interpreting geometrically these probability measures as being the natural generalization of the, you know, the, of the volumes of finite geodesic balls in some generalized manifold. So that's what we're going to use to define curvature in, in the context of a hypergraph and later on in the context of a causal network. So, given, uh, so, so we, we can apply this specifically to the case of a discrete metric space, in which case, obviously, this, this integral reduces to a sum 
uh, and we obtain what's called the multi-marginal optimal transportation distance between two discrete probability measures. And now the, the, the projection condition that defines uh, the, the, this, this set pi now becomes the, the, the condition that these two sums are satisfied. And we can specialize even further and, and take this to the, to the case of a hypergraph. I'm aware I, we don't have a huge amount of time, so I'm, I'm not going to take you through the complete details of this. But the, the basic idea is you can consider a directed hypergraph to be a collection of, edge, of directed hyper edges where each hyper edge maps from a tail set consisting of vertices x1 to xn to a head set consisting of vertices y1 to ym, in which case the Olivier Ricci scalar on the directed hypergraph becomes one minus the Wasserstein transportation distance between the, the probability measures mu a in and mu b out, where these measures are, uh, where mu a in is the sum over the probability measures for all of the incoming hyper edges to the tail set a and mu b out as the sum of over all of the outgoing of, of, of all of the probability measures for the outgoing hyper edges from the headset b and if we want to we can write these measures in full explicit uh, gory detail but basically all of this is trying to formally justify this intuition that you probably all already have that uh, if we want to generalize the notion of a finite ball in a hypergraph then we can just do that by if you want to consider a, a ball of radius epsilon in a hyper, in a directed hypergraph then you just pick a particular node then you look at all of the nodes that are adjacent to that node, then you look at all the nodes that are adjacent to those nodes, and so on. And then you effectively grow out this ball of radius epsilon, and, and then the, your, your volume measure is just a counting measure. It's just a count of the number of, of nodes that lie within a, a distance epsilon of that initial node. And, so the, the, and, and this, the, this derivation shows one that, in fact, it does indeed satisfy the axioms of a probability measure, and therefore we, we're correct to interpret it uh, as, as being something like a, 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 a volume measure. And so then, uh, and then once we have this notion of a, of a geodesic ball in the hypergraph, of course, then this notion of the average distance between a point on the geodesic ball and its corresponding point after parallel transport simply reduces to the one Wasserstein distance between those two, uh, between those two uh, probability measures, uh, mu a in and mu b out, uh, with respect to the standard induced hypergraph metric that I mentioned earlier, the, you know, the combinatorial metric between, between any pair of vertices, the number of directed hyperedges that you have to traverse to get from point A to point B. Um, and uh, what, one thing that's worth mentioning, by the way, is that actually Olivier's construction is a little bit more general than we actually need it to be, because in particular, it allows, via, uh, via definition of this function epsilon, it allows one to consider hyperedges that have arbitrary weights associated with them. Turns out for our derivation of GR, we don't need that. We actually consider only the case where each hyperedge has a unit weight uh, and therefore corresponds to a single unit of kind of elementary spatial distance. But uh, it's worth mentioning, you know, if you, if you want to derive kind of torsion metrics and things like that, then you can also define hypergraphs where, where you know, different hyperedges have different weights. Okay, so the reason for introducing all of this complicated formalism is now to be, to, 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 to be able to rigorously justify uh, us doing effectively dimension and curvature calculations in the context of directed hypergraphs. Because now what we can do is we can say, take a spatial hypergraph that corresponds to flat n-dimensional space, and let's grow a geodesic ball of radius r and ask how many nodes lie within that geodesic ball. And of course, if, it's, if it corresponds to flat n-dimensional space, that function will grow exactly like r to the n, we now know that if it corresponds to a curved n-dimensional space, that there will be a second order correction factor that is now proportional to the, Ricci, to the Olivier Ricci scalar curvature. And so this information allows us to do dimension and curvature estimates on arbitrary hypergraphs. So here, for example, is, so, I mean, obviously these hypergraphs are very simple because they just correspond to flat grid-like uh, two-dimensional and three-dimensional space. This is a, a more complicated kind of hypergraph. This is a, a hypergraph produced by one of our rules that we actually know limits to an asymptotically flat structure that, uh, that, that is therefore kind of like a two-dimensional manifold. And in fact, we can see by doing this, by doing uh, a, a, essentially a, a logarithmic difference estimate of the dimension, that it is approximately two-dimensional, but with certain higher order corrections that are proportional to the curvature. Moreover, even in cases where there isn't an obvious manifold-like structure, we can still define in, in a meaningful sense notions of dimension and curvature. So like here, we take up one of these hypergraphs. The, you know, the geometry of this thing is much more complicated. It doesn't, doesn't, doesn't seem to have a meaningful emergent geometry. It doesn't seem to correspond to a meaningful manifold structure. But nevertheless, we can still define its dimension and curvature. And so uh, in this particular case, it appears to correspond to something of dimension roughly 2.5. Uh, which of course indicates that because we're using 
uh, a, an approximation to the Hausdorff uh, dimension as opposed to the topological dimension, there's no rule that says it has to be integer. It has to be, the, the, the structure has to be integer dimensional. And so, um, uh, and actually I'll, I, might, I might talk towards the end about some of the implications that that has for a kind of generalization of GR that applies in, in fractal dimensional manifolds. But uh, that, that's, that's a topic for another talk. Um, oh yeah, so th these dimension estimates were just computed using a very simple logarithmic dis a difference estimation. Um, one really important thing that, that you will have noticed is that when we, because unlike a manifold which has a fixed dimension, or at least the connected component has a fixed dimension for, for some manifold, uh, these spatial hypergraphs don't have a dimension that's defined a priori. The dimension and the curvature both emerge from the combinatorial structure. So in particular, there exists this subtle trade-off it, when we compute this function n for, for, the, for the volume measure, um, there exists a trade-off between the exponential contribution from the dimension and the quadratic contribution from the curvature. And uh, one interesting feature of that is that if we want this, if we want something like the spatial hypergraph to limit to a fixed dimensional manifold-like structure, it pl that places certain constraints on the growth conditions for the curvature. Because if, effectively, if the curvature is allowed to grow without bound, then in the continuum, if you try to take an infinite limit, a continuum limit, then there will be no way for you to distinguish between a monotonically increasing curvature and a global increase in the effective dimension. And so in order for you to, to have a structure that limits to something that's finite dimensional, uh, that places certain conditions on the degree to which the curvature can grow. And, you know, spoiler alert, as I say, in the most general case, it turns out that those conditions are the Einstein field equation. But we'll get to that in just a moment. So, in order to derive the EFEs, um, we have to consider curvature not just in space, but in space-time, as defined by causal networks. So that uh, involves going to, to introducing um, what one new one new piece of, of sort of technology. So I want to ask a related question to the to the Ricci scalar question that I asked uh, I asked earlier, which is. We, you know, in Riemannian geometry, we have this notion of sectional curvature, and you know, the, the normal geometrical intuition for the sectional curvature, just to remind you, is you, know, you, you pick a point x, and you, you pick projection directions that are just you know, linearly independent tangent vectors, or in the simple case, they're just orthonormal vectors, u and v, and you ask, what, what, is, the, what is the sectional curvature uh, projected in directions u and v at point x? And what the sectional curvature is measuring is if you take a nearby point y that's within a distance epsilon, and then you, you go, uh, you go along uh, the, the, these two unit speed g and e6 u and v by a distance of epsilon, um, then the sectional curvature allows you to, to, to measure the ratio or the discrepancy between the distance between the endpoints of those two unit, unit speed g and e6 and the actual distance between the points x and y. Um, and, and so that, then I'm going to ask a you know, very similar question to the one I asked before which is, can we define a meaningful notion of sectional curvature in the context of hypergraphs and causal networks? And again, the answer turns out to be yes. This again was, uh, is based on, on the work of Jan Olivier. So if we have an arbitrary metric space uh, X, then we can define an analog of the sectional curvature that preserves this standard geometrical intuition. So now, instead of having uh, sort of orthonormal uh, vectors, we, we have unit speed ge graph geodesics or unit speed uh, geodesics in the metric space. And we're asking if we, if we take the, the exponential map from the tangent space onto the, onto the uh, sort of manifold, so to speak, uh, that gives us the, the end points of those, those two unit speed GD6 uh, 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 as a distance of epsilon away from their origin point. And then we can ask, what is the average distance? What is the discrepancy between the distance between those endpoints D and the distance between X and Y, which is delta? And just as in the Ricci scalar case, you know, the, the, that, that discrepancy is, is determined up to, up to second order by the, by the sectional curvature in these two, in these two directions. Okay. And we can validate that actually this, de de this definition is indeed compatible with, the, with our prior definition of the scalar curvature, because in just the same way as if we take a, an index contraction of the sectional curvature, we expect to obtain the Ricci scalar, we can, ve we can verify that if we take the average of this discrete, potentially discrete sectional curvature over all such vectors, over all such GOD6V, then, uh, then effectively what we're doing is we're constructing the set of all tangent vectors of length epsilon centered at point x, which is like a finite geodesic ball. And similarly for, for, the, for the set sy centered at point y, and then we're measuring the average distance between the corresponding points on, on sx and sy uh, after parallel transport. And we can indeed verify that the average distance between those points and, and the ratio of that average distance to the, to the distance between the centers is indeed given by the Ricci scalar up to second order as epsilon and delta go to zero. So now we have a, a mathematically consistent way of defining sectional curvature over uh, discrete metric spaces, including hypergraphs and causal networks. 
And so um, that's quite exciting because, of course, the, the sectional curvature in Riemannian geometry completely determines the components of the, Riemann, of the Riemann tensor. And so this means we can define some generalized analog of the Riemann curvature. And in particular, we can define uh, things like the, the Ricci curvature tensor and uh, other higher order contractions. So the reason I, I bring that up is because if we now want to consider uh, how do we assess the dimension and curvature in a causal network, um, we, we have this new problem, which is that unlike in the, in the hypergraph case, you know, the causal network, because of its, because of its Lorentzian-ness, it's a directed graph with, with all edges pointing monotonically downwards. And so we can't grow a finite geodesic ball. In effect, we have to grow a finite geodesic cone. We have to pick a geodesic direction through the causal network and then grow a finite cone uh, centered around that geodesic of length t. That's our analog of the geodesic ball construction. And so then, uh, again, in exactly the same way, uh, for a causal network that corresponds to flat n-dimensional spacetime, the volume of this, of this uh, discrete spacetime cone will grow like uh, t to the n. Uh, but for a, a causal, which, which we can see here for this very elementary flat uh, causal network, we can see, it's, we can see it limits to something that's, that's, two, that's flat and two-dimensional. But for, for causal networks that correspond to uh, curved spacetime, there is now going to be a correction term that we now know is proportional to the projection of the Olivier Ricci curvature tensor in the time-like direction. So in other words, when we picked that geodesic direction through the causal network on which to center this spacetime cone, we're now projecting the, curvature, the Olivier Ricci curvature tensor in that time-like direction. And that projection is giving us the second order correction to the, to the volume of the, of the, of, of the spacetime cone in the causal network. So here's a more complicated uh, spatial hypergraph in, which induces this more complicated causal network. And we can see that the hypergraph uh, limits to something that's roughly two dimensional and the causal network limits to something that's, uh, that's roughly uh, one dimension higher as we'd expect. Okay, so then the, the, this projection that we're doing, I mean, this, um, there's a lot of mathematical detail that I, I'm having to skim over here, but it's really, it's quite nice that, you know, effectively, uh, this notion of a, of a tensor index defined on a causal network or a hypergraph is given just by a geodesic direction in the hypergraph or the network. And that's, uh, that, that, that's the sense in which we can define these, these uh, projections of curvature tensors and so on. Um, the the, the time-like direction into which we're projecting the Olivier Ricci curvature tensor is exactly the same as the time-like vector that we defined earlier on in the special relativity case when we were talking about, uh, the, the, when we were parameterizing these foliations. In other words, this, this time-like projection in the direction given by alpha, by, the, by alpha times the normal vector plus beta. Um, okay, so one thing that you might uh, immediately notice is that many of the causal networks that we're considering here uh, have a property that's quite undesirable. So here's an example of, of, of that property. So you can see in this causal network, as we go down these, these different layers, uh, the number of, uh, of updating events that exist on the next layer actually increases exponentially. And so in particular, if we try to grow a finite geodesic cone in this causal network, as the causal network gets bigger, the, uh, the exponent in our, in our uh, volume measure is going to grow. And so it, effectively, if we, take a if we try to take a continuum limit of a causal network like this, it's going to end up being infinite dimensional. It's not going to co converge to something like a finite dimensional spacetime. And so that's kind of bad if we want this to be a representation of spacetime. And so one question that you could ask would be, what are the, you know, what are the constraints that we would have to enforce on the actual hypergraph dynamics to ensure that the causal network has a well-defined limit as a finite dimensional uh, spacetime-like structure? And okay, so one thing we can do is, I mentioned earlier that, that one condition in which that's definitely not going to happen is if the curvature is allowed to grow without bound. Because if the curvature grows without bound, you're continually adding these higher sort of quadratic uh, corrections to, to the volume. And so if you're, given that we don't have, you know, we don't have the dimension information, we don't have the curvature information, we have to, uh, we have to that all has to emerge from the dynamics of the causal network. If the curvature is allowed to grow without bound, then, then the dimension, then we, we can't distinguish that curvature from a, from a global change in dimension. And so one minimal condition that we need in order to, in order to uh, ensure that this causal network limits to something that's finite dimensional is that the second order correction, which we're gonna call the, the dimension anomaly, uh, when averaged out over the, over, the over the overall causal network, so the global dimension anomaly for the whole causal network, that quantity can't be allowed to grow without bound because if it can grow without bound, as I say, it will be impossible in the continuum limit to distinguish between its growth and an increase in curvature. So how do we, how do we determine this global dimension anomaly? 
Well, we average out over all events in the causal network. We start out by averaging out over all possible time-like projections for these uh, geodesic cones. And by, by averaging out over all of these time-like projections, that's equivalent to taking a contraction of the Ricci curvature tensor between the first and third indices. So that gives us the space-time Ricci scalar. We're constructing a volume average over space-time over the causal network. And so we, we weight the uh, space-time Ricci scalar by the elementary volume element in the causal network which is expressible in terms of the standard volume measure that we introduced earlier, d mu g. And so now our condition that the causal network limits to something finite dimensional becomes the statement that as the causal network grows, the rate of change of this global dimension anomaly uh, quantity, the, the rate of change of the global uh, second order correction to this, uh, to this volume measure should converge to zero as, as the causal network becomes infinite. So now if we make a weak ergodicity assumption, in other words, if we assume that the actual hypergraph transformation dynamics are sufficiently random, are sufficiently ergodic, so as to analytically justify exchanging for this sum for, a, for an integral as we take the continuum limit, then we obtain, of course, the classical vacuum Einstein-Hilbert action, and the, and the condition that the global second order dimension anomaly uh, converges to zero as the causal network becomes infinite becomes exactly the statement that the, that the vacuum Einstein Hilbert action is extremized. And so, of course, we can do the standard thing. We, you know, we, we have a standard uh, relativistic Lagrangian density. We take a functional derivative with respect to the inverse metric. We assume zero surface terms. We get this. And so, so as I say, the, the statement that, that uh, delta S by delta GAB uh, converges to zero as the causal network becomes infinite becomes exactly the statement that the vacuum Einstein Hilbert, uh, sorry, the, 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 the vacuum Einstein field equations uh, hold in the continuum limit. Now, of course, this argument only gives you the vacuum Einstein equations. To derive the full Einstein field equations, you have to go a step further, which I'm, uh, I'm already nearing the end of my time, so I'm probably not going to have time to, to walk through that full derivation here. But uh, loosely speaking, the way that that works is we give an interpretation of uh, upper index T mu nu as the flux of causal edges through a hypersurface of constant x nu in the causal network. That's the direct sort of translation of the statement that upper index t mu nu is the flux of uh, relativistic p mu uh, through the surface of constant x nu in spacetime. So effectively, you know, energy in our model corresponds to the flux of causal edges through a space-like hypersurface. Momentum corresponds to the flux of causal edges through a time-like hypersurface. And then we note that so some, a, a large fraction of the energy is associated with just maintaining the background space, just maintaining the background hypergraph. Then on top of that, there can exist local uh, persistent topological obstructions that we have a combinatorial classification for in terms of this thing called the Seymour-Robertson theorem. Um, and our sort of conjecture is that these localized topological obstructions in the hypergraph and in the causal, ne causal network correspond to baryonic matter, correspond to elementary particles. And so these topological obstructions correspond to locally increased connectivity in both the hypergraph and the causal network. You can see, the, you can see an example of one propagating through a, through a manifold-like causal network here. So this is kind of the minimal model of baryonic matter. So then if we subtract off all of the causal edges associated with the maintenance of space, and we consider only the causal edges con uh, involved in the maintenance of these baryonic matter contributions, these locally increased regions of connectivity in the both the causal network and the spatial hypergraph have also have to be accounted for when we're, when we're doing this dimensionality calculation. So in addition to the second order contribution from the curvature, there's also an additional contribution from the, from the matter density, from, from the density of these topological obstructions. And so that has, when we run through the argument again, that has the effect of adding in a matter field term to the relativistic Lagrangian density. And so then you know, doing the same extremization argument yields the, the full Einstein field equations. Okay. So that's, that's a little bit about some of the sort of relativistic and gravitational properties that we now kind of have proved to be the case for, for these Wolfram model systems. There's many, many more things that I, that I really would love to talk about, but which we, we probably don't have time to cover here. Um, one of the things that I've kind of mentioned uh, briefly a couple of times is that, you know, because um, unlike in conventional differential geometry, our manifolds, which are these networks, these hypergraphs and causal networks, don't have a fixed dimension. Dimension can actually vary both locally and globally. And so this implies that actually, so, okay, our derivation of the Einstein field equations has assumed that the causal network has a fixed dimension in the limit and that the curvature is allowed to vary locally. 
But the point, and that's of course, that that's how we get correspondence with standard GR. But of course, we could just as equally have said that actually the curvature is fixed globally and the dimension is allowed to vary locally. And we could also have, we, we could formulate a version of the Einstein field equations in terms of local dimension change that would also be perfectly valid. And we could also consider the fully decoupled case where both curvature and dimension are allowed to vary. And they ha it turns out we've, we've done a few initial computations about this and, and, and they turn out to have a bunch of really interesting interactions with, with each other. Um, so th this implies a kind of a grand generalization of, of general relativity to, to, the, to, the very, to, to the condition in which dimension is treated as a dynamical variable. Um, this also, as I mentioned right at the start, has implications for cosmology because if, uh, if as seems to be the case in a, in a large class of these models, one starts from a spatial hypergraph that exists in effectively infinite dimensions and then converges down to something finite dimensional, the conformal structure of that of such a universe turns out to be equivalent to a universe in which the speed of light is a, is a dynamical scalar field variable and in which there exists a phase transition in the effective speed of light during the early universe. And we can make correspondence with the, with the so-called petit Obrecht uh, model of a variable speed of light cosmology, which yields, uh, you know, which yields a valid solution to the horizon and flatness problems and sort of correctly predicts the large scale homogeneity and isotropy of the universe without the need to postulate an inflaton field. That's another kind of rather interesting uh, avenue of investigation. Um, I also mentioned right at the start that there's a generalization of this whole argument that gives one the, the path integral. And uh, so, so the, the, the way this works is, you know, we've so far considered only these causal networks that correspond to a particular updating order. But right at the beginning, I showed you an example, if I can find it here, of, a, of effectively a multi-way causal network, a causal network that has updating events, not just for a single branch of evolution history, but actually between uh, branches of, uh, that has causal relations between different branches of evolution history. And so this multi-way causal network is a structure that's like a, an ordinary causal network, but has you know, interactions between different branches of, of history, different branches of the multi-way system. And then it turns out, if we apply the same argument that gives us the Einstein field equations in the continuum limit of the causal network in space-time, if we apply the same argument to the multi-way causal network, we get the path integral. In fact, so, so what happens effectively is that the, um, the where, where in this argument we get the space-time metric tensor, in the context of a multi-way causal graph, we get the Fubini Studi metric tensor on projective Hilbert space. And, uh, and then, the, the, then instead of, and then if we try and uh, make the statement that the, uh, that the multi-way causal network limits to something that, that doesn't end up being infinite dimensional, then in, instead of getting the Einstein-Hilbert action, in, as we do in the space-time case, we actually get the path integral action. And this has a bunch, as I kind of, very briefly mentioned towards the start, this has a bunch of really cool, this gives you a bunch of very cool geometrical intuitions for kind of standard aspects of the quantum mechanical formalism. So in particular, you know, in our model, uh, the canonical computation, commutation relations and the uncertainty principle turn out to be the direct analog of Riemann curvature in the multi-way causal network. Because uh, in, you know, in exactly the same way as the Riemann tensor tells you the, the failure of commutativity of the covariant derivative operator, the failure of, uh, of geometrical uh, of information to be preserved as you parallel transport it, uh, tra parallel transport some vector around uh, around a closed curve. Uh, the, the the analogous uh, concept in, in the multi-way causal graph tells you uh, sort of the, again gives you gives you a failure of commutativity of some generalized covariant derivative operator which yields the the canonical commutation relations. So effectively, the uncertainty principle becomes the analog of, of curvature in, in the in the context of a multi-way causal network. And all of the stuff that I've mentioned uh, here actually has a bunch of really neat, neat implications for other areas like quantum information theory, quantum computational complexity theory, and things like black hole thermodynamics. And so again, I unfortunately don't have time to discuss it here, but um, it turns out if you consider, uh, when you consider the multi-way causal network, there exist uh, things like event horizons, apparent horizons, trapped surfaces, not just in space time in the, in the context of a causal network, but actually in the multi-way causal network, uh, we, we have these, these analogs of trapped surfaces that we call entanglement horizons. And one of the neat features of, of our interpretation of quantum mechanics is that uh, if you have infalling uh, sort of information into, into a black hole, uh, the, the, that, that information in the multi-way causal network actually never passes a true space-time causal event horizon. It, 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 gets it instead gets preserved at the entanglement horizon, which exists just outside. And so we can make a sort of a direct correspondence with standard like holographic and ADS-CFT uh, yeah. resolutions to the black hole information paradox, those kinds of things. That's all still a very speculative direction, but that's, that's another thing that we're, that we're super excited about. So um, I, I, I'm, I'm already over time, so I, I'm sorry for, for speaking so long. So th thank you very much, all of you, for listening, and I'm, I'm very happy to take any questions. Okay, thanks a lot for this uh, 
very nice uh, crash course on the gravitational properties of the Wolfram model. I thank you on behalf of the audience. So let me see whether there are questions from uh, the audience. So maybe I can, I can ask a very uh, curiosity. Um, so we know that you know, the, the Einstein gravity is not the, the most general construction because uh, it puts the uh, torsion equal to zero by end, basically. So in your language, is it possible to, uh, to describe also these kind of effects? Yes, absolutely. So, so okay, that, that's a really good question. So um, I, I smuggled in the torsion freeness. I smuggled in the, the, the Levi-Civita connection uh, before when I said, that this we're going to assume this para this function epsilon is, is unit is uh, has a value of unity everywhere. So effectively, if you have a spatial if you have a uh, if you have a hyper edge that goes in one direction, there's also a hyper edge that goes in the other direction, and and the, the, those two things have the same weight. If we instead relaxed that condition and we said that the, this function epsilon uh, for you know for the hyper edge connecting vertices u and v that 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 weighting can be different to the weighting of the hyper edge connecting vertices v and u, and if we do the same thing in the causal network. Then we actually get a we get a torsion metric, and as you say, we we, we get these these more general sets of of, of Einstein equations that, that that are not strictly torsion free. I see. Okay. Thanks. Um, oh, by the way, sorry. Just on the on the context of uh, on the subject of generalized sort of Einstein equations, um, a, another neat thing is that um, one. So the the, the obviously the, the derivation that I showed you uh, implies that there are condition that there are sort of second order conditions on the curvature, um, but actually, if if we d depending on exactly how um, how quickly we want the dimen we want the causal network to converge down to something finite dimensional. We can actually, on certain con under certain convergence assumptions, we can also derive higher order terms of the Einstein equations. Effectively, we can derive certain conditions on on the Weyl curvature. We can derive conditions not just on the volumes of geodesic bundles in the causal network, but on, on certain convergence assumptions, we can derive conditions on the on the shapes of those geodesic bundles that give us um, sort of contribution to the to the higher order contractions of the Riemann tensor. That's another kind of generalized gravity story that we're also very interested to see you know how that works out I see. Okay, thanks and other questions or curiosities from from the audience uh, if i may i wanted to ask about this introduction of the hyperbolic uh, nature of the network you did at the beginning yes um and so i wanted to understand if this is uh, uh, necessary to do and you can only go on if you uh, introduce this by hand or at some point it naturally emerges from something else which I've missed in your talk. Uh, is it a strict requirement you have to put in at the beginning of your construction or you can go and do it without? That, that's a really great question and so I mean the, the honest answer is we don't yet know. Um, it, uh, so this construction um, we don't know how strict the causality conditions have to be uh, in order for you to do these kinds of derivations. The derivation is the easiest if we assume the strictest possible causality condition, which of course is global hyperbolicity. But you know, whether we could get away with just having you know, future distinguishing or past distinguishing space times or you know, totally non-vicious space times or something, we don't yet know if that's gonna work out. So uh, to answer the, the, sort of the second part of your question about you know, how, this, how this condition emerges. So um, obviously if you, if you have, um, there, are kind of, there are two related instances in which you can get a failure of hyperbolicity in one of these causal networks. Either you have a loop in the causal network where you, know, you, have, a, you have a directed edge that goes back up again in your, direct, in your layered digraph embedding. That of course corresponds to a CTC and we know that you know, they sort of trivially violate global hyperbolicity. But actually you can also have the case where you have a causal edge that connects two points on the same layer, uh, that connects two edges on the, uh, sorry, two, two events on the same layer. And that you can kind of think of as being like a degenerate case of a CTC, a, a CTC that doesn't take you, that takes you exactly zero distance back in time. And that also, as I mentioned, corresponds to a local failure of hyperbolicity. So we, we do, in fact, you know, th this is not a natural feature of these causal networks. We do, we do have plenty of examples of causal networks that have CTCs and which violate uh, you know, uh, hyperbolicity in other kinds of ways like you know, related to these, uh, to these uh, pairs of updating events that are connected by, by uh, causal ledgers. Um, it just happens to be the case that you know, it's, it's difficult to, define, uh, to, to introduce a well-defined foliation if you have a violation of hyperbolicity. And given that the arguments I constructed about you know, growing finite geodesic cones and things like that, they all kind of depend on th this notion that you can define a well-defined, that you can introduce a well-defined foliation. Uh, you know, the, the, the problem arises, of course, if you, if you have a loop in your causal network, then uh, 
it's kind of that there isn't a, a straightforward way you can introduce a foliation, you can introduce a space like hypersurface that still respects the causal partial order. And that's a problem that we don't yet know how to solve. Um, but, uh, you know, it, 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 I'm not ruling out the possibility that, that we may be able to do the same constructions, as you say, by, by assuming kind of less, uh, you know, less, less rigorous uh, causality conditions. Um, I hope that, hope that answers your question. More questions? Thank you. I do have a question. I'm Daniela. Mm, so you mentioned that a good portion, basically, of energy goes into maintaining the structure of space-time itself. But on the other hand, yes. in general relativity, we have the equivalence principle. It essentially, tells us that all forms of energy are the same, basically. So how do you reconcile this with, with that? Right. So that okay. Great question. And uh, and so it's it, at the level. You know, at the level of the actual hypergraph and the actual causal network, the equivalence principle holds almost by definition. Because, as as I say, you know, if you interpret energy as just being the flux of causal edges through a space like hypersurface, then uh, you know the, the 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 flux of those causal edges doesn't care whether the causal edge is associated with the maintenance of the background space or if it's associated with the propagation of, a, of an elementary particle. That's a that's a distinction that we impose kind of after the fact. And so the the, the point is that the um, if you want to make connect, you know, in conventional GR, you know, you generally make a separation between the cosmological constant term and and the uh, and, and the you know the, the stress energy term. And so we have to have a way of doing that if we want to connect it to the known formalism. And so to do that, what we basically do is we take the causal network and we divide it up into the background space time and these localized topological obstructions, and we consider the fluxes of causal edges that correspond to both things separately. But of course, in reality, there's no such distinction. They're all just causal edges. They're all fluxing through the same space like hypersurface. They all contribute in the same way. So the, so the equivalence principle holds. It's just our interpretation of the energy momentum uh, you know, it, it's, it involves uh, explicitly violating the equivalence principle, so to speak. I hope that, hope that makes sense. Yeah. Okay, thanks. More questions or comments or curiosities? Uh, just one uh, final comment, maybe. Uh, um, there is a um, uh, construction that is uh, similar to yours by uh, Arcani Ahmed, who uses uh, a cluster algebra, simple rules from cluster algebra to construct uh, complex structures. So are you aware of this uh, uh, research? Can you comment on this? Uh, so I, I, I'm aware of the research. I, I don't understand it well enough to be able to speak. I, I don't understand the formalism of cluster algebras um, as, you know, as well as I should. And so I can't really, I, 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 I don't want to kind of speak uh, about that specifically because I, I don't think I necessarily have anything sensible to say. Um, one thing that is worth saying is, yeah, I, I completely agree that there is, a, there is clearly a great deal of overlap between the stuff that NEMA has been doing with, with cluster algebras and the amphitohedron program and all of that kind of stuff. And we'd be really excited. I mean, in fact, we're, we're currently in the process of trying to uh, convince Nima to come and uh, to come and get, kind of give us give us on on, on the on the team a, a, a sort of crash course in, in what he's been doing and how it might connect to what to what we're up to. Um, but that's, so it's a good question. I don't know the answer, but I, I agree it's it's almost certainly going to end up being related. Okay, thanks. So any final comments from the audience? I don't see any. So <laughs> well. I thank you again for this uh, very nice talk. Thanks for uh, your time. And uh, see you soon. It was my pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me. It was, it was really great to be here. Uh,